Blog Talk Radio. Hello, everyone. Good morning. This is Lori Smith on Blog Talk Radio. It is 6 o'clock here in the morning. Uh, I don't know. It's Thursday? Friday? I'm not sure anymore what date it is. Oh, it's Friday. Friday, uh, May the 27th. I missed my show yesterday, and uh, I couldn't get in. I had um, issues with Skype, and I don't know. If it, I don't think it was even the Internet. I think it was just Skype. So, uh, sorry about that. I was trying to get in, and halfway through the show, I just finally gave up. I thought, there's no sense now. So, so you know, sorry for anybody who was actually waiting and, li- and waiting for the show to start. Um yeah, I appreciate everybody being here. Thanks very much. It's awesome. It's been a crazy busy week um, moving my sweetheart into my place because he can't be on his own anymore. And he's had a he was in the hospital for two and a half weeks and it's just been so busy. Um, but yeah, I want to. I'm glad to be able to continue doing at least my morning shows for now. And um, yeah, I appreciate everybody who's taking the time to tune. It's awesome. And uh, we're looking at Robert Bernie's webpage. It's called Joy to You and Me. And this is from a website from healing.about.com. And it, it's uh, some good stuff. He's written a whole lot of web pages there, and I did pop the link into the chat room. So anybody who wants to check that out, you can take a look there. And, uh, it's, the link is so long, I just can't read it out. Like it's so many symbols, numbers, and letters, and it's it's incredibly long. And I didn't shorten it. So, um, but it's Robert Bernie, B-U-R-N-E-Y, and he's a an author. He's a he's a codependent therapist. He's a spiritual uh, teacher and. He's written so many pages about, you know, codependency, uh, boundaries, in, inner child work, uh, grief, and role, the, you know, fear of intimacy, all kinds of stuff. And it's a great website. So hopefully everybody's getting something out of this. And I know it's helpful for me. So I'm not a counselor or therapist. I'm just a private citizen paying to do my shows. And I want people to know that because I, I say that on every show because it's really important for people who may be listening for the first time. And... Um, you know, I'm just a private citizen. I'm not a counselor or therapist, and you have to listen at your own discretion. Because I talk, I'm talking about abuse, and abuse abuse is a very sensitive subject, and most people find it, um, you know, very makes them uncomfortable, and it's understandable, you know. But I'm used to dealing with this. I've had to deal with it my whole life, and I don't mind talking about it. But I know a lot of people do do have, uh, you know, can, you know, may may make you feel uncomfortable. So you have to ultimately know what's good for you to listen to, and um, you know, if you feel that the topics of abuse or anything related may bother you, then it's your discretion and you have to turn off the show, right? So thanks everybody for being here. Also, young people under the age of 18, I just ask that you have permission to listen to my show from an adult, somebody who's older, an adult who can help you make a decision, your parents or someone who can help you decide whether you should be listening because there's a lot of adult content on my shows and I'm the Canada Regional Director for Dreamcatchers for Abused Children and you know we're standing up to fight to save children's lives and to promote child rights and, and to, to save, protect children, right? So you need to be protected at all times, and you need to learn how to keep yourself safe online. If you're not sure how to do that, just type into your browser, Internet safety, online safety for children, things like that. The FBI has a great website, fbi.gov, and you can go there and you can get some information on on Internet safety for parents and Internet safety for children. Just make sure you do know how to keep yourself safe when you're online. And, um, yeah, so we'll get right into this. Today I I was actually going to look at this one section called Grief... um, Grief, uh, love, and the fear of intimacy, and that was really Robert Birdie's um, taking a look at Robert Birdie's personal story and what it, some of the things that he had been through. Probably not everything, but some. And so, if you want to go and read that, it's it's uh, you know it's mainly him talking about his own um, wounded child within and what had happened, and it's really quite interesting to, to read and, and sort of how it all played a role in his life. And the, the behaviors and attitudes he took on because of these things that had happened to him as a child, and and then he realized that he needed, he really needed to get help. So he was in therapy, and um, it really shows like his journey on that one particular section. So if you want to go to the sec to the uh, site map, you can find it. Grief, love, fear of intimacy. But he doesn't really go into talking about grief, love, or fear of intimacy. It's really mainly his story. So I just thought I'd just go sort of skip over that for the show. But I did read it, and it's really quite interesting. And then I wanted to take a look at, he's got a whole lot of information here about codependency, and I want to take another look at that. I know I did a whole bunch of show on codependency um, previously, probably about, I don't know, six months ago? I mean, it's been a long time. But I, I thought, well, we'll go through what he has to say here about it, because the, the stuff that I was looking at before was from uh, John Bradshaw, he, uh, Healing the Shame That Binds You, and all that stuff from John Bradshaw. And so this is a little different take on it, because it's from Robert Burney. And he's a codependent therapist, so uh, you know he's a codependency therapist. So it's quite interesting to see what his take is on it. And he's written a book called Codependence: The Dance of Wounded Souls. And I'd like to get that book someday, and I hope to be able to do that. So 
we're just going to pick up here at uh, what is codependency, codependence by uh, Robert Burney. And so he says the dance of codependence is a dance of dysfunctional relationships, of relationships that do not work to meet our needs. That does not mean just romantic relationships or family relationships or even human relationships in general. And he says the fact that dysfunction exists in our romantic family and human relationships is a symptom of the dysfunction that exists in our relationship with life, with being human. It is a symptom of the dysfunction which, which exists in our relationships with ourselves as human beings. And so this is from his book, and he says, and the dysfunction that exists in our relationship with ourselves is a symptom of spiritual disease, of not being in balance and harmony with the universe and feeling disconnected from our spiritual source. So that's from Robert Burney from the book Codependence, The Dance of Wounded Souls. So there's a variety of ways to describe the condition of codependency. Here are a few, and he's written here, um, codependency is at its core a dysfunctional relationship with self. We did not know how to love ourselves in healthy ways because our parents did not know how to love themselves. So this is if your parents were the people that were were dysfunctional and codependent, right? They've shown us how to be that way, right? That's the thing. Because children are just little sponges, you know. We just learn from the environment we're in. We learn from those who are around us and and, the, and what's happening around us as children. So that's what we take on as behaviors and other attitudes and belief systems, right? So he says, we were raised in shame-based societies that taught us that there is something wrong with being human. And the messages we got often included that there is something wrong uh, with making mistakes, which is not being per- with not being perfect, the being with, with being sexual, with being emotional, with being too fat or too thin or too tall or too short or too whatever, he says. As children, we were taught to determine our worth by, in comparison with others. And if we were smarter than, prettier than, better grades than, faster than, etc., then we were validated and got the message we had worth. And he says, and that's kind of interesting, isn't it? In a codependent society, everyone has to have someone to look down on in order to feel good about themselves. And conversely, there's always someone we can compare ourselves to that can cause us to to not feel good enough, right? to put ourselves up against somebody. I was talking about that before because he was talking about that before. Robert, Robert Bernie was saying that, you know, we compare ourselves in, in society. You know, we compare ourselves to those around us and really we shouldn't be because <laughs> it's kind of ridiculous to compare ourselves to other people. We're all different and we all have our own our own human experience here and it really does belong to us. And it's not w- why we should be comparing ourselves to somebody else. It doesn't make any sense. I know that I, do, I, I used to do a little bit of that. Now I just absolutely, I just completely don't do that because it was very wounding to me to think that because a society says you have to have a big house and a and about two or three cars, you know, in North America we're talking, and uh, that you gotta, you have to have a, a great education, you have to have a top executive job, and if you don't have the best lawn and the best clothes and you're not skinny and you're not walking around having hosting garden parties in the backyard and you're not shopping every day, spending two or $300 on new clothes and all this stuff, that your life is meaningless, you know what I mean? And I, I actually realized that at a pretty young age because I grew up poor, and not poor like, you know, some countries around the world, but by America, by North American standards, we were poverty level, and you know I didn't have a lot of things growing up, and I didn't want them. You know what I mean? Like I didn't know I I, I needed them. You know what I mean? It didn't bother me. I still had some stuff, and I had you know I mean I ate, I had food. You know, unlike a lot of these children out here who don't have anything to eat. You know, but we were still considered to be just right at poverty level, and you know for me to try to compare myself to somebody else is just a setback immediately. You know, because of uh, I don't. You know, there's no family money. I mean, my parents couldn't couldn't provide anything for us. They never, they they couldn't provide an education for us. They couldn't pay for cars for us. They couldn't they couldn't help us with anything, because they didn't have any money. And there was no family money. And there's no family home, so there's no family home to go back to for Christmas. There's no family home to go back to. There's no grandparents. There's no, there's nothing. <laughs> so for me to compare myself to somebody else is absolutely ridiculous. You know what I mean? So what I did is I decided that I would a long time ago that I wouldn't do that and I would live my life according to the way that I was happy and personally and I wouldn't care what other people thought. And so actually I've done really well in that area because I really don't care what people think about my situation. Um, they can try to live two or three minutes in my shoes and I guarantee they'll they'll be in a psych ward probably. Um, a lot, I, I think we all have strengths and inner strengths and inner things that that make it so that if we, you know, if we even tried to live in somebody else's shoes for a few minutes, we wouldn't be able to do it. You know what I mean? It's, it's, you know, so many of us have been through so much, 
And, you know, we have to give ourselves credit where credit is due. And so I don't judge myself by the Joneses next door. <laughs> you know, I mean, I think I'm doing really well because I'm still here. I'm still fighting to have a good life and to, to be good to myself and to be good to others. You know, I don't judge myself by the world standards. And uh, it, it helps me a lot to not do that because I'm not then thinking, oh, look at me, I'm such a loser because I don't have this and I don't have that. That's how a lot of people feel. And um, I've talked to many people over the years that have said stuff like that. Well, if I just had this and I had that, you know, life would be good. It's like, you know, that just doesn't make any sense to be like that. You know what I mean? We have um, each day to get through, and that's really all we have because we don't know what's coming tomorrow. And a lot of people base their their happiness in the things that they have, uh, mon- like monetarily or, or material things, and then they, you know, they find out that they've, that they, they're, the next day that they've lost everything, they lose their job, they lose their home, and then they're just miserable, you know. And it's like, and then I've heard people say stuff like, oh, these people, you know, look at these people. A comment was made to me one time, this one person, I won't give names or anything, but this one person I was working with said, said, yeah, when people get fat and they get kind of dumpy looking, it's because they just give up on themselves. And I, this person was skinny and she thought she was really good and, and she kind of came from a wealthy family and they were all kind of uh, pretentious, you know nose in the air and stuff, and I thought, you know what, try living in my shoes for about 10, maybe 10 or 15 minutes, it, it would probably just kill her, and I kind of felt sorry for her, you know what I mean, because I thought, she bases everything on looks and material value, and I thought, and I actually felt sorry for her, you know what I mean, I was sitting there thinking, you know, like, that's absolutely a horrible way to live, you know, and I feel, and I do feel sorry for her, I don't, you know, I mean, I just worked with her, and I don't know her personally, but I, I worked with her for three years and worked right across from her for three years, so I got to see how she, what she bases her belief system on and everything. And I just thought, I, I just really felt sorry for her because I thought, man, down the road when life throws some real curves at her and she actually does get sick and ill because the body does give out and she loses her looks and she loses her family money or something or she loses her health, how is she going to handle that? You know what I mean? Because she bases everything based on looks and material stuff. And I thought, wow, I felt so sorry for her because... It's not about that, you know what I mean? Like it's about it's about how our in, loving our inner selves and allowing ourselves to be loved and to show love and to give love. And if people can't figure that out, then they're going to be very, very disappointed and very sad. And uh, to me, that's just like, um, you know, it's our personal choice. And we make a choice whether we want to follow what the world system says is is successful or whether we want to look inside within ourselves and see what we've done and see it as successful. You know, and and to me, success is not built on the world system. Success is uh, getting through the day and, ha- and enjoying the day as much as possible, and really, uh, really, really using my strengths and relying on God. And to me, that's success. And um, you know, that's the thing. Uh, but so many people are living this lie, this North American dream, which is just really a lie. And um, you know, we are so really blessed to be here in North America to have what we have compared to so many countries. And I think it's really all about at the end of the day, is just being happy with yourself and being happy with, with the blessings that you have in your life. So many people are, are not like that. I spent my life with two parents who hated this life. They hated them, each other. They hated themselves, and they wanted to kill themselves. They wanted to kill the family. They were always talking about death and, and murder and suicide and all this stuff. And they were so miserable that they couldn't be happy that they had these... My parents couldn't be happy that they had they had each other, and they had this seven beautiful children that they could have loved, and they could have... They could have nurtured all of us. They could have taken us in the, bed, in the living room and said, lined us all up and said, we just love you, sons and daughters. We're so happy to have you in our lives. And, and let's go to the park and let's play. And, you know, let's go do something. Let's do something as a family. Like, there, there was none of that. My parents hated the whole situation. And they, they showed us how to hate our lives and how to hate this world and how to hate each other, how to hate other people. And so it's only through, really through an example of other people and really the grace of God that, any of us in, in in our family have been able to come through this, you know. So I mean, it's it, that's that's success to me is just being able to sit here at the end of the day and say, no man, this is good. You know, I'm very thankful to have what I have, um, and I just I just cherish really every day, even though some days are kind of bad, you know. Some days are really crappy, you know what I mean. And uh, we can't get away from that. You know, the other day I was sitting in the hospital actually a week and a half ago. Uh, being told that my sweetheart was was dying and that I needed to phone a, uh, I needed to go and start phoning funeral homes, 
<laughs> and I was like, well, that's kind of a bad day, you know. But the thing is, is the next day he got better. And I was like, right on. So, you know, this is the thing, by the grace of God, you know what I mean? we got to be thankful and very happy for what we have because life can throw you some huge curveballs. And if you base everything on materialistic stuff and and, and uh, what, what North America says is successful, you will be a miserable person at the end of the day. And so that's I think this is really important for people to, like, uh, like Robert Bernie, I think, has a really good handle on, on that situation because, you know, we can't compare ourselves somebody else we just can't we because we'll never feel good enough we'll never feel right enough according to the north american standard <laughs> of what success is and what 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 being a, a good human being is you know what I mean? so we have to look on the inside of ourselves and be happy with ourselves and in order to do that we need to learn how to love ourselves you know so he, he, he talks about this here later and he says codependence could uh, more accurately be called outer or external dependence the condition of codependence is about giving power over our self-esteem to outside sources, agencies, or external manifestations. So the condition of codependence is about giving power over our self-esteem, our own self-esteem, to outside sources, agencies, or external manifestations. So he says, we, are taught, we were taught to look outside of ourselves to people, places, and things, to money, property, prestige, to determine if we have worth. And that causes, that causes us to put false gods before us. We make money or achievement or popularity or material possessions or the right marriage or the higher the higher power that determines we if we have worth, right? So he says we have our self definition and our self worth from external manifestations of our own being. So that looks or so that looks or talent or intelligence becomes the higher power that we look to in determining if if we have worth. So all outside and external conditions are temporary and could change in a moment. See, that's what I'm talking about, man. Like if we make a temporary condition our higher power, we are setting ourselves up to be a victim. And in blind devotion to that higher power we are pursuing, we often victimize other people in our way to prov proving we have worth. And that's like people who are uh, climbing the job ladder at work, you know, and the main goal is to get the top money and be the top dog and, and because they want to drive the biggest, best car and have the best house because that's what they think life is all about. And um, so many people will tell you that's what life is about. And hey, I mean, if that's what makes them happy at the end of the road, I feel sorry for them. But, I mean, if that's what makes them happy, well, they have to go with what they have to do. But I just don't pay any attention to those people because they have no interest in their lifestyle. So, but this is the thing, because if they lose their home and they end up in a little shack somewhere, they're not going to be happy. You know what I mean? They put all their, their their trust in money and material goods, right? So they're never going to be happy, especially if they lose their job, which they will, because nobody ever gets to keep those jobs forever. <laughs> Sooner or later, you either end up old and in a senior's home, you know, or you end up uh, uh, dead, or you end up uh, losing the job. But things will change because it's never the stays the same. It can't stay the same, right? So you have to it's putting yourself in. So your your uh, belief system in it and 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 your whole idea of of who you are in a temporary condition is not a good idea. That's what a lot of people do. So he says, I believe that we all are one. We are all one. That we all have equal worth as spiritual beings, as sons, as daughters of the God Force, Goddess Energy, Great Spirit. Not because of any external manifestation or outside conditions. So this is what Robert Bernie says, and I think that that's pretty pretty accurate. Codependency is, he says, a particular vicious form of delayed stress syndrome. Instead of being traumatized in a foreign country against an identified enemy during a war, as soldiers who have delayed stress are were traumatized in our sanctuaries, the people we love the most, instead of having experienced that trauma for a year or two as a soldier might, we experienced it on a daily basis for 16 or 17 or 18 years. And a soldier has to shut down emotionally in order to survive, survive in a war zone. We had to shut down emotionally because we were surrounded by adults who were emotional cripples of one sort or another. And that's very true. You know, most soldiers go through that stuff and it may only last for a tour or five or six or seven years, you know what I mean? And maybe some a little bit longer, you know, depending on what type of their military uh, it's career for them or whether they're just in and out for a short, short term or whatever. But the thing is, is that it's horrific in what they go through. And then you got to think of a child as being manipulated and bombarded in this dysfunctional environment. Whether Whatever type of abuse it is doesn't seem to really matter. Whether it's physical, verbal, emotional, psychological, sexual, it all hurts, you know, and neglect. And they, you know, these children may have to put up with this year after year after year after year. And you think about the damage done. You know what I mean? It's absolutely horrific. Codependency, codependency he says, is a dysfunctional emotional and behavioral defense system 
When a society is emotionally dishonest, the people of that society are set up to be emotionally dysfunctional. And in this society, being emotional is described as falling apart, losing it, going to pieces, coming unglued, etc. Other cultures give more permission to be emotional, but then the emotions are usually expressed in ways that are out of balance to the extreme of letting the emotions control. And the goal is balanced between is balanced between emotional and mental, between the intuitive and the rational. So traditionally in this society, men have been taught that anger is the only acceptable emotional for emotion for a man to express, while women are taught that it is not acceptable for them to be angry. <laughs> So if it is not okay to own all of our emotions, then we cannot know who we are as, as emotional beings. And also, traditionally, women women are taught to be codependent, to take their self-definition, including their names and self-worth, from their relationships with men, while men are taught to be codependent on their work, career, ability to produce, and from their presumed superiority to women. So codependency is a, a disease of lost self. If we are not validated and affirmed of who we are, that we don't believe we are worthy of love or lovable. And often we got validated and affirmed by one parent and put down by the other. And when the parent who is loving does not protect us or themselves from the parent that is abusive, it is a betrayal that sets up sets us up, sets us up to have low self-esteem because the affirmation we received was invalidated right in our own homes. So he says, as be, and being affirmed for being who we are is very diff- different than being affirmed for who our parents wanted us to be. If they could not see themselves clearly, then they sure could not see us clearly. So in order to survive, children adapt whatever behavior will work best in helping them get their survival needs met. And we then grow up to be adults who don't know ourselves and keep dancing the dance we learned as children. So it's quite interesting. That's very, very true. And I mean, I do a whole lot of talking about that, you know, that it's like, you know, as children, you know, we really can't help what we're put through as children, you know, whatever the dysfunction is, whatever the abuse is in the home, you know, you're you're stuck with it, you know, as a child, and that's, you know, you're trying to learn, like, you're trying to just figure out how to survive in that, and you know, develop all these strange behaviors in order to do that, and it's so incredibly hard on people, and I know that, you know what I mean, like, just seeing the difference in between my siblings and myself, like, there was, there was seven of us, and we all, we all, came out different because of the abuse. It's not like we all banded together and, you know, kids against the parents sort of thing. And it's not like the kids all banded together and just hold each other and hug each other, try to hide each other so that you know, we wouldn't get hurt. You know, it wasn't like that. It was like a we were all attacking each other. The siblings were attacking each other. The only close relationship that my, my brothers had, really the, the main close relationship, was my brother Chess and my brother Rob. The two of them were pretty close in age by a year and a half, and they were also very close in their heart and their mind. You know, they were, my brother Chess was always trying to protect my brother Rob, and it's funny because Rob was older uh, than Chess. And so <laughs> Rob should have been the one to protect Chess, but Rob was the one that my dad was beating on. My dad had it in for my brother Rob. I don't know why, but he did. And um, Robert was the one who was receiving most of the abuse and as out of all the brothers. And so, you know, my brother Chess would try to stick up for him and try to protect him. And there was a bit of a relationship there, which was pretty cool. And then when my brother Chesley got killed when he was 19 years old, my brother Rob just went into depression, and uh, he was already manic depressive, I'm sure of it. And he 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 was just suicidal after that, and he was just a, a cocaine addict, and he was suicidal. And uh, uh, 13 years later, he killed himself. So, you know, many years later, but on the day, actually one day later than my brother had been killed, my brother Chess um, was murdered, and then 13 years later the following day after so in other words my brother was probably thinking about my brother chess and was probably really depressed and and decided to kill himself the the next day it's really horrible and uh but their their relationship was really the only one that was very close the rest of us were all split off and always against each other and that's the the, the environment our parents set up for us right was everybody was out to get each other the parents were out to get the kids the kids were out to get the kids and the kids were not out to get the parents because our parents had complete control over us and did whatever they wanted to us well there wasn't much we could do like my brothers would try to stand up for my mother to protect my mother but my dad was in the military he was an air force man and he was a big man he was a tall man and he was in good shape and he could he could he could beat my brothers up no problem right and so you know that's what he would do and so if my if my if my mother was you know needing protection then my brothers would try to go and help her then my dad would beat them up and then I would try to protect my brothers, and then I would get beaten up, but I was only like four or five years old. And then, you know, onward, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 10, <laughs> 11. 
you know, absolutely ridiculous. But this is the life our parents set up for us. But this is the thing, you know, we didn't develop any good relationships within our home. We weren't, there was no, um, there was, it was just completely dysfunctional. So he says a dysfunctional relationship is one that does not work to make us happy. And he says codependence is about having a dysfunctional relationship with self. So with our own bodies, minds, emotions, and spirits, with our own gender and sexuality, with being human, because we have dysfunctional relationships internally, we have dysfunctional relationships externally, and we try to fill the hole we feel inside of ourselves with something or someone outside of us. It does not work. I, I was told that my, by many people that our family was codependent. And these were people like that probably had done some study on psychology or something, so, you know, what, psychologists or whatnot. My parents were actually brought up on charges, child abuse charges. They were diagnosed at the time. They had to take a mental assessment and to see where, you know, their their mental capacity, whether we were going to be allowed to stay in the home because they were brought up on child abuse charges. And the courts wanted to remove us, but they told her because our parents were diagnosed mentally mentally ill. My dad was. Uh, borderline schizophrenic and my mother was manic depressive and they were abusing each other and abusing the kids and the court said the only way the children are going to stay home is by supervised visits with social workers and you as parents will have to get counseling and all the children will have to get counseling all separate and all the children and you as a family will have to get counseling family counseling and you and your husband need your own personal counseling because they were both abused as children and also, the family would all need to have their own, the whole family counseling, and my parents would have to have their own marital counseling. So we were supposed to be going to all these major, major counseling sessions, and we went to two, and that's it. So, I mean, my older siblings vouched for that, and they're the ones that actually gave me that information. I was two years old at the time. So, But the thing is, is I remember the social workers coming in because they came in for a couple of years, and about the time I was about four, um, they stopped coming. So the abuse just continued on. And it's pretty sad, but that's the thing, you know, and, and it did have a huge effect on our lives. But I know, like, my sister is still codependent today. She's trying to get her needs met through shopping. Um, she's trying to get her needs met through me. You know, if I don't go shopping with her, life is over. Uh, she doesn't necessarily want to live with my life and have me live her life for her, but she uses people to find her happiness. She can't just be happy. You know what I mean? It's like, well, if you don't go, then you don't love me. It's like, what? You know, like if I don't go shopping with her, I don't love her? I mean, what's going on with that? And so I don't hang around with her because she's too dysfunctional. And I, I love her dearly. I love my family. So that's the issue. I thought I hated my parents, right? But I didn't hate any of my siblings. But I, I thought I hated my parents for so many years because I used to tell them to their face that I hated their guts. And I was hoping they would kill me. You know what I mean? That's how much pain I was in. But the thing is, is that um, I realized years later that I didn't hate my parents, that I actually really loved them. And that was why it hurt so much. If it didn't, if I didn't love them and didn't want to feel love back from them, it wouldn't hurt. But it really hurt because I really loved my parents and I, and I wanted them to love me, you know, and it never did happen. And my sister, you know, I mean, we're, we're, we're the closest in age, but, you know, and I love her dearly, but I can't hang out with her anymore because I can't take any more of her BS. And she doesn't want to hear anything from me either. So the two of us are just, you know, we're done, right? So there's only a few people left in my family, and I've cut them all off. So I actually I feel so much better, you know what I mean? And people would say, isn't that a shame? And you know what? It, it really is, but when, it, but you'd have to spend, you know, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes in my shoes, and you would be able to see where I'm at. My dad is mentally ill. My brother is hateful, and he hates everything. He hates God, and he hates me, and he hates everything that everybody's doing. He doesn't even really love his wife. He had an affair with on her, and he beat his children, and he, he's a, he beat his son. He's a miserable, miserable man, and he's 60-odd years old, and I have, want nothing to do with him. He's, abuse, he's abusive. He's an abuser. He grew up with my parents. My parents abused him, and he never got any help, and he's 60 years old, and he's just a miserable um, miserable old man, right? And my sister is the next closest thing that I would say, you know, in my family that I actually love dearly. And, um, you know, I can't hang around with her because I can't take her anymore of her garbage, right? So it's really sad, but you know what, though? We have to do what we have to do, and I'm so much better off for not hanging around them because they just bring, they bring me back down to that place I was as a child, um, you know, in the corner, just, you know, bracing for a beating and also just hating them. And they, they bring me to that place again all the time because that's where they're used to seeing me. See? So that's where they want me. And that's where I refuse to go back there. You know what I'm saying? So I'm not going back to the corner, cowering in the corner anymore. And I'm done with that. I'm done with allowing people to abuse me. So, you know, I, I had to do that. And there was a, a real reason for it. But I do have a lot of support, thank God, from friends who I consider my family. Well, thanks, everybody, for being here. I'll be back on um, next week for sure, for sure. This week, probably not. i got to move, and i got a lot of work to do. I'm moving Cecil and um, 
cleaning and packing his place, and it's just been really busy. So I thought it'll be on my weekend shows, but it will be back on next week, probably, hopefully, um, my normal schedule. Take care, everybody. Be sure and reach out. You know, if you can't, if you feel like you can't cope and you just can't do it, well, you make sure that you do stick around and you get some help because I'm telling you, we, there are bad days. There's bad days for everybody on the planet. They're bad nights, but we. But if you don't stick around, you'll never experience a good one. And there are better days out there, but we have to make it happen. And so, you know, make sure you stick around and you get some help. Call a crisis line if you have to, you know. Like, do whatever you have to do to to to, to stay here with us and to, to get better, to allow yourself to heal, right? Whatever it is, you know, whatever it takes. You're worth it, right? Have a great day, everybody. Talk to you later. <laughs>